morning, everyone. Good morning. So glad to be here this morning. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. 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 I want to welcome all of you that are online, that are watching this as well. It is so good to be back here this week. Um, you know, we got through, and I'm going to make it sound like it was laborious. We had Palm Sunday, we had Easter Sunday, both wonderful celebrations. And I'm so thankful that we can get together and celebrate. But I'm really excited about our series in First John. Um, and I just, I, you know, again, going through the book is, to me, is, is a wonderful thing. And uh, we're going through, um, um, well, I was going to say, when I finish First John, I'm considering going ahead and doing Second and Third John as well. Because they all just tie together. And it's like, it, you know, it's almost like saying, okay, we're going to go ahead and we're going to watch the movie. And we're going to cut out the last 30 minutes. Uh -huh. And I don't want to do that. So we're going to go ahead and after we get through 1 John, we'll do 2nd and 3rd John, which are short. But I do believe they all tie together. That John is dealing with the issues in all three of these. So, so stick with us for a while. We've got a little ways to go. We're <laughs> this morning, we're in 1 John chapter 4. And I'm going to look at verses 1 through 6. I've entitled this morning's message, Acknowledging the Lordship of Christ. And if you notice the songs this morning, they all really kind of look at the, the kingship, the lordship, our honor for God. And, and I you know, wanted to kind of bring that across. Uh, and that last song is like one of my favorites anyway, so I'll play that anytime I get a chance. Um, but, uh, but the idea here of the Lordship of Christ. And so we're going to look at this, verses 1 through 6, and um, see what the Apostle has for us this morning. So 1 John chapter 4, the first six verses read like this. I'm reading from the New American Standard. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of Antichrist, of which you have heard that it, that it is coming, and now it is already in the world. You are from God, little children, and have... Over, and, and have overcome them, because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak as from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. He who knows God listens to us. He who is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Father, I ask your blessing upon these words. Let them go forth in the power of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Speak to us today, Father, through your word and through your messenger. In Jesus' name, amen. As I was, because we had a couple weeks off, uh, because of uh, Palm Sunday and Easter, and I was going through and looking at the passage, and I knew where I needed to be. And I thought, wait a minute, we already discussed Antichrist, and I talked about that uh, from a previous chapter, and the idea is not Antichrist, big A individual, but Antichrist is a spirit that is against Christ. And so um, I wanted to make sure that I'm like, okay, I didn't think I got this far, but when I saw that, I thought, that doesn't come up too often in Scripture. I better double check and make sure I'm in the right location, which I am, so that's good. So we're doing all right. Scripture repeatedly warns against false teaching. We see this in John's letter, and we'll see it in all three of his letters as we go through them. But it warns against false teachings which deny or distort some aspect of the gospel. The origin of such teachings is attributed either to human error or demonic inspiration. And this is what we usually find. And I am one of those individuals personally where I understand the, the, the significance of demonic inspiration. I find that uh, some of the things that uh, I think we want to attribute to that, we can pretty much attribute to the first part, human error. Okay. Uh, I find I can pretty do a, I can pretty much do a, I can do a pretty good job myself on gumming up the works without a lot of help. All right, and that's just part of who we are. But that's not to say that everything is human error. It can come in both. And in today's passage, John takes us back to a previously addressed issue: the issue of false teachers or antichrists. And this false teacher issue is what will carry through in his letters. And that's why I think it's really good that we continue to build through all three of these. In this section of his letter, he shares with us, with his readers, the ability we have to discern what is true from what is false. 
And that discernment comes in acknowledgement of who Jesus Christ is. When I originally started putting this message together this week, I, I, really, I, I had in my mind the concept, the idea of the spirit of truth. And I didn't even title it the spirit of truth. I had to go in yesterday and change all of the slides that had that because I really felt that acknowledging the lordship of Christ is something that is very important and something that is lacking in our world today. And I want to I want to stress this point, realizing this, that we can only acknowledge the lordship of Christ through the spirit of truth. Okay, I was reading in my devotions this week, and I want to think it was a, a devotion by Spurgeon, and he talked about faith, hope, and love. And in the, in the idea, when, when, when it is in the devotion, he said, well, we can love Christ, and we can hope in Christ. It is our faith in Christ that really drives us. It's what, it's what, what we need. You know, you can hope for things, and you can love things, and not have faith in them. And our acknowledgement of Jesus Christ is our acknowledgement of the faith that we have in God. And so we, we have this faith, in this, and in this, uh, we have this ability then to discern. But the discernment is based on our faith in Christ, our faith in God, and the inworking of the Holy Spirit. Our faith that the Spirit is working in us and through us, trusting in the Spirit. So John offers us a simple formula for discernment that I want to share today of the acknowledgement that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh from God. Now, it's not quite that simple because there are many out there today who acknowledge that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. As a matter of fact, I believe these false teachers have already acknowledged that fact. However, in acknowledging that, it's not enough. I can acknowledge anything that, you know, that, that I want and unless I, I can found the, find the foundation for that, foundation for that, it's very difficult for me to, to be able to bring it together in such a way to, to believe it for what it is. There's a difference in acknowledging something and holding on to it and making it dear to our lives. So we don't, don't just acknowledge Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. John says this, it's important. But we must also, and more importantly, acknowledge his lordship. Jesus Christ is God. And as such, he has come in the flesh, dwelt among us, in order that we may be saved. In our time together, then, we will consider the scriptural imperative of the acknowledgement of the true lordship of Jesus Christ and the means by which we are able to accomplish this. And so I'm going to share three other passages of scripture uh, that are in the points this morning, one from Paul and a couple from John. And it's the John passage that got me thinking we need to probably go a little bit further with this as well outside of just 1 John as we move forward. But let's take a look at this first point. The first point is we acknowledge the Lordship of Christ through the work of the Holy Spirit in us. Paul puts it this way in his letter to the Corinthians. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaks by the Spirit of, who speaks by the Spirit of God says Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now I want you to take and kind of chew on that for a minute. I want you to think about that. No one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now you notice what Paul's saying here is that we can. That there's this idea that we can acknowledge the existence of Jesus. Historically, Jesus existed. There's a lot out there that shows us that this idea of the historical Jesus. There have been conferences and books and lectures on the search for the historical Jesus. And yet, we could, instead of looking at Jesus as just a historical figure, we need to look at Jesus Christ as Lord. And this is what Paul says here. What he's saying is, is that it can only happen through the working of the Holy Spirit. I've, I've been really working to try to get this whole idea of this, that my studies for these, these comp exams for, for my, my program done. And I, I'm just really, I was telling Debbie this morning, I've got to try some new ways. I've got to try some new things to try to cement all of this in here. Um, maybe sleep with my iPad under my pillow with the notes open. I don't know if that'll work or not. Uh, I don't think it will, uh, but something's got to happen because I just, I just, I'm not comfortable yet, you know. And I want to be, I don't have to be all knowledgeable, but you want to be comfortable. So this idea here of, of, of learning and things like that. So I'm doing all these studies, all these studies on Jesus, and, and I'm reading all these things, and I'm talking, I'm reading on historical criticism, and I'm reading. Redaction criticism, or I'm reading how the New Testament writers use the Old Testament. I'm doing all these things. And, and you can get so caught up in all of the language and all of the verbiage and all of the studies 
that you can miss the, the significance of all of it. Why do we study these things? And there were many theologians who lost this, this, this point in their studies. We don't study these things because of Jesus as the historical figure. We study this be, uh, to understand Jesus as God. If we lose sight of the fact that there's this lordship of Christ in our lives, then we're losing something. And the only way we can truly acknowledge that is within the working of the Holy Spirit. It is from the Spirit. Now, I was doing a little research this week, and I found that there are roughly in the world today 20 major religions. Okay? 20 major religions. And I, I went to different, several different sites, and they all kind of acknowledge this, and it's a roughly, okay? So, you know, I say that because uh, there's going to be somebody that's maybe online that's just going to, well, they're going to go out and challenge this, and I'll probably get an email through the, the website. If you think, I found da da da. Okay, congratulations. You did a really good job. I was doing a really quick search, right? My point is 20, of course, the exact number of total religious beliefs is far beyond that. Okay, well, I'm talking about main religions of which Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Taoism, the, the list goes on, okay? Are a part of it. But there are many, many more. And there are those, you know, that even with, within certain beliefs have other beliefs and things like that. We're not even talking about that. However, what we need to realize is what sets Christianity apart from these other religions, what makes them different. Is everybody saying, well, it's Jesus Christ is God. Right. But how do we know that? Without being working with the Holy Spirit. It's the Spirit who reveals Christ to us. It's the Spirit who shows us why Jesus Christ is who he is. It's through the Spirit that we can acknowledge who Jesus Christ is. Yeah. These other religions are struggling to find an answer, and they would say, no, we have the answer. God bless you. I tell you, they, the, the answer is found in Christ. The believer needs the Holy Spirit to play an active role in their life if they are to live in a way that honors Jesus Christ. I can be a very good, I can be a very spiritual person, but if I don't live to honor Christ, I'm not living as God has set me apart to live. I'm not living in the spirit. Christianity must be more than just a religion. It must be an experience. And that experience is the experience of the Holy Spirit. It's the experience of Jesus Christ living and active as a part of our lives. It's an experience, this experience is not a personal, physical experience. And I say that because as I was preparing these words, and preparing what I have here today, I was thinking about the fact that there are religions out there that the religion is really based on mental capacity and the ability to do certain things and to be, uh, to amaze uh, others with their with the physical abilities of things that they can do, you know, uh, whether it's sleeping on a bed of nails or walking across hot coals or whatever it is. That's not what it's about. I'm just going to speak to this picture of handling snakes. Uh, anyway, that's not what it's about. It's not just the physical experience, what I can accomplish. It's the spiritual encounter that's a part of it. The spiritual encounter with the Holy Spirit. And as, a, as Pentecostals, we must get back to realizing the importance of this. As Pentecostals, we're really in tune with who Jesus Christ is. We may be in tune with what, who the Holy Spirit is and what the Holy Spirit's role is, but I, I ask you today and I challenge you to begin to seek the encounter of the Holy Spirit in your life. That personal encounter. But sometimes I hear Christians and, and, you know, speak of salvation as if it's I, you know, the idea of being saved, which is a wonderful thing, don't get me wrong, but they almost express it as if it was a, just a physical encounter. I know I'm stumbling through some words here, but I think I'm, I'm getting an acknowledgement in the back too. But I'm sorry, I'm just, I'm just excited here about this whole idea, this whole thought. That we, salvation, yes, I'm saved, but we think I'm saved from death. And the first thing I hear the way they're saying it, it's like, I'm not going to burn. It's almost like this physical thing. But I'm here to tell you this morning, the encounter is a spiritual encounter. It is not just a matter of saving the body. It's a matter of saving the soul. And that is done through the inworking of the Holy Spirit who draws us to Christ. Christ is our Redeemer. Christ is our intercessor. But without that inworking of the Holy Spirit, 
we will not acknowledge the Lordship of Christ. The second thing that we see here is we must acknowledge the Lordship of Christ by receiving the Holy Spirit's anointing. Okay? We acknowledge who it is, we receive the Holy Spirit, and, and this idea of the Holy Spirit uh, brings us to Christ, uh, salvation, but I'm here to tell you there's more to it than that. 1 John chapter 2 uh, verses 20 through 23. I'm going to take a step back to what we looked at previously. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you all know. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father, and whoever, the one who confesses the Son also has the Father. This idea of a spiritual anointing, and I think this is what sets us apart to help us to under, acknowledge the Lordship of Christ in our life. There's more to this than just salvation of our souls. We are called to be men and women of faith, grounded in the word and the spirit of God, anointed for service and for purpose. John continues to praise and encourage believers in the community by explaining to them that contrary to the claims of their opponents, they are the ones who know the truth and can identify the lie. I, again, I was thinking about this, this, this process and, and everything, and the importance of this for us as I was uh, looking through my notes, even again this morning. You see, the world finds it difficult to distinguish the truth. It has a hard time doing that. Truth is relative. Your truth, my truth. It's all what we want to make of it, isn't it? At least that's what the world says. So I decided, I would, if I was going to go ahead and kind of give an illustration, I'm going to go to uh, what I think is probably one of the greatest sources in, in the history of television, and that's Star Trek. You can't go wrong with Star Trek. And you can't go wrong with probably my favorite series, which was, you know, some of, some of you out there right now are hissing when I say this, Deep Space Nine. Okay? Love Deep Space Nine. You know, it's one of those ones that's like at least, if not every year, every other year, I kind of watch through all seven seasons. And my favorite character is Elon Garrett. He was the, the, the Cardassian, not Cardassian, 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 no, it's one of those, one of those aliens. Uh, anyway, uh, Taylor, and he was supposed to supposedly a spy, and every once in a while he and Dr. Bashir would get into this conversation about truth. And in one of the conversations, uh, Dr. Bashir, and all these events that happened, everything, and Dr. Bashir's response is, um, so, so what you're telling me is everything that you told me is true, and, and, or something along that line, and, and Garrick's reply was, my dear doctor, they're all true. All the events are true. Even though they, they didn't go together, they were all true. To which the doctor replies back, even the lies? Garrett's response was, especially the lies. If we begin to see lie as truth, we lose an understanding of what truth really is. And this is what we're struggling with in the world today. We cannot distinguish. And here's where the danger lies for us. Okay? The believer who walks in the Spirit uh, lives in the truth. And knowing the truth is found in Christ as Lord. And I'll get into this a little bit more in acknowledging this Lordship. But if we're not careful to accept the truth that is the truth, absolute, God's truth, then we begin to question Jesus Christ's lordship. You see, the truth is revealed to us by the spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit, and it is the spirit that reveals to us the truth that is Jesus Christ. And so how do we acknowledge the fact we have this book, which for some is nothing more than history, right? Historical events. As I had mentioned at the beginning, I'm looking at, you know, as I'm studying, I'm, I'm looking at different forms of criticism. One of the forms of criticism is historical criticism. Looking at the historical nature behind what's here. Literary criticism. Looking at the Bible as nothing more than literature. 
I look at the narrative. I look at the prose. I look at, I look at all these various ways in which the, the writers wrote. The different techniques and things that are used. And we begin to break it down to, to um, different types of critical analysis and miss the one thing that's most important of all, and that is the fact that Jesus Christ is Lord. Now, we don't throw this word out. We don't get rid of it. We hold on to it. We hold to it dearly. But I know there was a time in my life, and I can attest to a time in my life, when uh, I, as a teenager I was a Christian, and I got to a point where I had walked away from the Lord for a few years. But I always had a Bible with me. I always had a Bible. When I was uh, in, right out of high school, I went to the University of Cincinnati, and one of my suite mates in the, where I lived, uh, in the rooms that we lived in, the room of suites, a suite of rooms, I guess it would be, um, uh, he questioned this uh, and said, well, how do you know it's true? I knew one guy that believed that a bunch of guys got stoned one night and wrote it. One night, boom, it's gone, here it is, text. I'm not even talking about that. What I'm talking about the fact is there was one, so how do you even know it's true? What proof do you have that this, that what you have here is true? I wasn't walking with the Lord at that time. I couldn't give an answer. But when the Holy Spirit came upon me, and I received the Spirit of God, and I received, received the revelation that it is God, everything in here began to make sense to me to understand the truth behind what God was doing. Without the Holy Spirit, we can make this nothing more than a lie. And there are many out there today that will do that. Why? Or how? Well, they'll do it simply by this. Questioning its truth. Jesus Christ is Lord. Truth. Jesus Christ is God. Truth. God created the heavens and the earth. Truth. Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose again. We just finished that celebration. Truth. Jesus Christ promised he would come again. True. Infathomable for the non-believer. There are many within the, within the used to be in the body of Christ that have walked away because Jesus didn't come in their time, but has chosen to come in the time of the Father. We must realize that the only way that we can experience the revelation of God's truth is through the anointing of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We need that anointing each and every day. We, um, we take our vitamins every day. You know, we have these vitamins and we go through this, this regimen and some days I'm like, how do I do these pills with the vitamin? You know, but I take them. And my wife's philosophy is this. Let's try to stay healthy on this side and not on not have to be repaired on the other side. Let's be proactive. Let's be preventive. But, you know, after all these years of not eating well, I miss my regular regimen of cheeseburgers. Okay? But every once in a while, I gotta ask, can I have a cheeseburger? And we get them. You know, I still haven't cut the pizza out yet. I'm sorry, that's hard. Hard to cut that pepperoni out. And the coffee. But the point is, is that, you know, um, we, we, the same is true for us here. If we understand this, if we, if we can begin to realize that we need to accept the truth and the anointing of the Holy Spirit now, because I'll tell you what, on the other side, it's final. If you don't walk in the Spirit now, you're probably not going to walk in the Spirit later. You know, the Bible talks about this, uh, uh, you know, the blaspheming of the Holy Spirit. Rejecting and ignoring the Spirit's work in your life as, as the Spirit seeks to draw you to Christ. Not accepting the truth that is the Spirit of God. If I don't accept the Spirit's working in me here, I, I will not acknowledge the Lordship of Jesus Christ in my life. And some, for some reason, I just feel there are those out there right now that are just like, you know, 
who just want to tear their hair out and say, I, you know, you, I don't understand what you're saying here. You, you just need to stop. But I'll be honest with you, okay? You cannot come to Jesus Christ without being working in the Holy Spirit and acknowledging that Spirit's work. Try as hard as you may. You can't do it on your own. I speak from experience. This brings us to our third point. We acknowledge the Lordship of Christ by continuing in his teaching. So the Spirit now reveals Christ to us. And for this, we're going to go to 2 John, verses 7 through 11, which we will deal with in, in greater detail down the road. But in 2 John, verses 7 through 11, it says, For many deceivers have gone out into the world. Those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh, this is the deceiver and the Antichrist. Watch yourselves that you do not lose what we have accomplished, but that you may receive a full reward. Anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. The one who abides in the teaching, he has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring his, this teaching, do not receive him into your house. And do not give him a greeting. For the, for the one who gives uh, him a greeting participates in his evil deeds. Oh boy, are those strong words. Okay? If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, what teaching is that? The teaching of the Father and the Son, the teaching of Christ, acknowledging Christ as Lord. Of having God, if they don't have God, they don't offer this teaching. If they go too far, don't even let them in. Now, stay with us for a few weeks, and eventually when we get there, we'll go into greater detail on this whole idea. But for right now, I'm just wetting the whistle. Okay? So I'm not going to build on that. Because that's not what we're for. That's not what we're doing here today. But see this idea. John reminds his readers that when someone adds to the biblical testimony of Jesus Christ, a subtraction from the truth of who he is and what he did is inevitable. If I add anything to the truth that is Christ here, if I add anything to this, I'm removing something else. Because there's only one truth and there's only one way, and that's Jesus Christ. For instance, Jesus Christ says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. As the world seeks to create a happy medium between God and man and the truth of Christ, it dilutes the truth of he with human, human falsehood. So what does that mean? Well, if I, ex if I do this, if I hear Jesus say that he's the only way because he is Lord and he is God, and I say, no, there are other ways. I have now added to the means by which I can be saved and taken away the power by which Christ has saved and said this is the only way. We can't have both. It's one or the other. Either Jesus Christ is who he says he is and will do what he says he will do, or we create a... a, a Christ in our image instead of God's image to do our bidding and our will. And the more we go down this path, the further down this path we go, the more we begin to subtract from who Jesus Christ is as we begin to add to who we want him to be. The believer who continues in Christ's teachings will not be coerced into the false teaching of the enemy. We will, not, we will not allow the enemy to convince us that Jesus Christ is anything other than who he is. This is a difficult thing, to, again, especially today, because let's be honest, there are many out there that say the gospel is offensive. It's exclusive. It's unfair because Jesus Christ is the only way. I don't know what to tell you. Except that if you accept anything other than this, you are not walking in the anointing of the Spirit, and you have not accepted the truth. And as I said, there are 20, roughly 20 other major religions in the world. What makes them different? 
Because you're seeing they do a little study to find where each and every one of them think about who Jesus Christ is. If Jesus is a historical figure, then they have to have an opinion. How many of them are willing to accept the fact that Jesus Christ is God, the Son of God, God incarnate, and that he died for our sins? No, he was a good teacher, he was a good prophet, he was a maniac, he was a terrorist or a usurper of, of Rome? Who knows? They've taken and repackaged Jesus, added to, only to take away. While the world is filled with deception, it is also filled with the truth of God for all those who choose to seek it. You know, here's, and I think this is, this is important for us, this is key. Because I have done it myself. We look at we live in a postmodern culture where, where truth is relative. Well, let me put it to you this way. Truth is not relative. Truth is absolute, and truth is here. By the same means that I just talked about for, for Jesus, we only, by adding to truth, we take away what truth really is. But it still exists. God's not forcing truth into the world. It's there. We're choosing to repackage and change it to benefit ourselves. We cannot be coerced into any type of false teaching because this is of the enemy, whether it's from Satan himself or from our own doing. There are many out there today, men and women in power, in leadership, Many out there today who, um, you know, are influential in a variety of ways who are unwilling to acknowledge this truth because it will not benefit them. The Christian must actively seek the truth of God and not be trapped in the lies of the deceiver. We have to acknowledge that. that what that means for me is that if I'm looking at a situation right now and I think, well, you know what? Maybe there's some gray area there, but the Spirit speaks to me and says, no, this is not true. I have to acknowledge and accept it is not true. I may not like it, but that's how it has to be. Because God's truth is absolute. The Christian walk begins with an acknowledgement that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And an acceptance of him as personal Savior and Lord. It is grounded in Christ and built by the leading of the Holy Spirit. It does not allow religious pluralism or relativism, uh, but rather a sure foundation built upon the rock of Christ. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians reminds us of these words. For no man can lay a foundation other than that one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. There is no other foundation on which we can build. It's, it's, it's the absolute, factual truth of Jesus Christ. And how do we know it? By the inworking and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. If, if what I think and what I say and what I do and what I teach is contrary to the Spirit's leading, it's not the Spirit who's wrong, it's me. To attempt to lay any other foundation is a lesson in futility. And let me put it to you this way. It's a lesson of futility, both in this life, because you're going to walk away very disappointed, and in eternity, because you'll spend eternity very disappointed. This morning, my challenge to you is to go beyond the mere acceptance of the existence of Christ. It's easy to acknowledge that Jesus is real. It's easy to acknowledge that Jesus is Lord. But it, can you acknowledge that Jesus is Lord of your life? I acknowledge that Jesus is God. Someone can say that, oh, he's the son of God. And then go out and live for the world. You can't do that. Can you acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord of your life? Let's bow our heads. As we prepare to close this morning, that is my challenge. Not just acknowledging Jesus Christ existed. Not just acknowledging that Jesus Christ is even the Son of God, but acknowledging, acknowledging Jesus Christ is Lord 
of your life. How do I do that? Allow the Holy Spirit to begin to speak to you. Allow the Holy Spirit to begin to anoint you. Allow the Holy Spirit to begin to reveal to you the truth that is the truth of God. And accept that truth without reservation. Stop making up excuses. Stop making up truth. Stop making up reasons for what, how we should live and begin to live the way that God has called us to. You know, when John says that antichrists are in this world, he's not saying antichrist. He's not even saying people that are going out there and, and pitching uh, against Christ completely. He's saying men and women, even within the body of Christ, who are walking in a way that goes anti to the truth who Jesus Christ is. You can think you're a believer and be anti-Christ. But the Holy Spirit changes all of that. Because the Holy Spirit reveals the truth. And so, Father, this morning, as we close our time together, for those that are online and listening, I pray, Lord, that you would bless them as well and be with each and every one of us. And, and Lord, I just ask in Jesus' name that you would... Reveal your truth to us, and then we would acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord in our lives. And we would live in such a way that we would honor him in that acknowledgement. Pray that you keep your hand upon us, each one. Draw us unto you. And for those that don't know Christ as Savior, I ask, Lord, that you would speak to them now and renew your truth. That they would acknowledge the Lordship of Christ. They would receive the inworking and the revelation, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And then we begin to walk in that light of truth. I pray that you go with us and keep your hand upon us. Bless the week ahead and continue, Lord, to keep us safe during this time. And we do pray, Lord, for an end to all of this. We know we have vaccines and all of this stuff, but I'll tell you what, Lord, uh, uh, the great testimony of the power of the living God would be to dispel this completely in a moment. If that be your will. I pray that we make it so. Go with us in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to God bless you all, and I want to thank you all for being here. As uh, always, if uh, you had the chance and you brought an offering this morning, there's a basket up front here to put that in. If you're online and, and you would like to give, you can do so online through the church website, the donate button, or through a, a text to give option that we have. Uh, be sure to follow us on Facebook, and uh, we will post our uh, the sermon later. So take your opportunity to share it with someone if you would. And God bless you all. Have a great week. And God be with you.